Okay, so this session follows on from the uh, one immediately before where we looked at literatures around uncertainty um, and this one um, takes it a step further and asks can we learn from other domains where uncertainty is a central concern um, because within the pastoralist project of course we're thinking about how pastoralists live from live with live off uncertainty but uncertainty as a challenge of course is central to many other areas this talk is the beginnings of some thinking about how to develop a conversation uh, with others and I'm going to talk about three different domains um, where uncertainty is really central to current discussions about um, what to do um, having faced crises having faced emergencies having faced challenges there's a sense around that current institutions current governance arrangements current practices are just not up to the mark they're not fit for purpose but how has the debate unfolded in these areas so I've chosen four I could have chosen many many others uncertainty is not a phenomenon or a sense of uh, uh, knowing about the world that is exclusive just to these four areas and pastoralism far from it it's a much wider uh, debate but uh, this talk is really about trying to think can we learn and develop a conversation between pastoral settings which as we know uh, long uh, confronted uh, uncertainty and others who are struggling with these issues um, uh, all the time so the first area to look at is finance and banking now it may seem odd to link pastoralism with finance and banking they seem incredibly distant but I want to try and convince you that uh, there are more links than you might imagine now on the slide here uh, is a quote from Andy Haldane who is an economist at the Bank of England, the chief economist, in a fantastic paper he wrote soon after the financial crash of 2008 called Rethinking the Financial Network. And his analysis from a you know, real insider's perspective um, and with deep understanding of banking and financing, finance systems was that what happened during the financial crash which caused huge ructions in the global economy was that a process of securitization increased the, the complexity dimensionality of the system of the financial network and the network as a result of processes of voluntary regulation in particular became more dense but also more opaque less transparent firm strategies of diversifying actually resulted in increased uncertainty across the system as a whole and the result was this was the crash so he engages in this paper in a sort of systemic analysis of of, of networks and another paper he also comments on governance arrangements which are also relevant to explaining the crash he argues that the financial crisis was rooted in an exaggerated sense of knowledge and control familiar he notes risks and counterparty relationships outstripped banks ability to manage them servers outpaced synapses large banks grew to compromise several thousand distinct legal entities and when Laban brothers failed um, the big finance house it had almost one million open derivatives so there was what he's arguing effectively is that the system had become ungovernable there was a shock to it and the whole thing fell down like a pack of cards now there's been since 2008 9 there's been a huge amount of actually really fascinating research on finance systems looking at uh, networks as these papers did governance arrangements also the cultures and behaviors of key actors traders finance analysis and so on eth ethnographies of banks and and uh, finance houses and um, there's a sort of common theme that runs through a lot of this work 
um, that the, this incredibly sophisticated market in, in derivatives spread across a huge number of actors with very limited social interaction between them beyond the sort of electronic exchanges that allowed the trade to happen and based on voluntary regulation uh, meant that the whole system became incredibly unstable and, and subject to, to collapse. Stefano Battiston, um, who's an economist in Switzerland, I think, uh, argued in a paper with others that small errors on the knowledge of the network of contracts can lead to large errors in the probability of systemic defaults. This is a consequence of the collective dynamics of what are called small world networks. Now, I mean, we're not going into the detail of all of this research, of which there is, uh, there are mount there's mountains of papers, um, some very uh, technical, some uh, more accessible. But it echoes debates that happened long ago in ecology, for example, in mathematical ecology, decades ago, Bob May and others argued that uh, complexity doesn't necessarily result in, in stability. Um, and so it was within banking systems that we saw uh, that happened. Um, equally in ecology and thinking about disease dynamics and thinking about forest fires and so on, we, uh, we see um, the same dynamics happening. And there are important parallels between thinking about the, the ecology of systems, the role of super spreaders, the role of networks, the role of, uh, of particular dynamics um, that have been translated over into debates about finance systems, which equally I find interesting as someone interested in cross-disciplinary, cross-sectoral exchanges. And there are a number of papers out there, including written by Andy Haldane, which were written with ecologists at the time. Moving on, um, within this debate in finance and banking, to, to simplify it, there seem to be two, as it were, big positions on how to deal with uncertainty. The conventional uh, approach, pre-crash, was the voluntary regulation, individualised accountability, complex networks and diversification would be the way to deal with things. That was how regulators, uh, analysts and others suggested things uh, should be pre-2018. This was highly problematic as we've seen. After the crash, and it's not a universal position, but um, Haldane and many others make the, make the case, is there's a need to increase transparency, regulate and create more collective accountability, getting people to talk to each other, create networks that have social relations at their core. Think harder about cultures in banking and the practices of, of key players. And as I say, borrowing from disease management, look at issues of contagion in networks, the role of nodes in networks, super spreaders, how does collapse happen? when uh, we're dealing with complex systems and move from that very individual voluntary approach to a more collective regulated approach um, uh, in thinking about how to how to how to deal with complex systems so i think we can learn an enormous amount about from this these debates and i think they resonate massively with uh, what we're thinking about in pastoral settings so thinking about pastoral settings, we can ask, well, what are the structures of networks? Um, how are they constituted socially, culturally? How is economic behavior embedded in these relationships? And how does this act to offset um, volatility in markets? What forms of knowledge exchange enhance transparency and accountability? And what new forms of more collective and social regulation and accountability need to be in there? And I think very often pastoral networks, market networks and other networks are, as it were, much more on the right hand side of this diagram than on the left. Uh, much more embedded, much more social. So maybe the bankers can learn from pastoralists. Um, and we can all learn from the disastrous collapse of financial markets in 2008. We have a session coming up on, uh, on markets and, and so-called real markets, and we can think about 
this a little bit more uh, later. So the next big area, which I think has been uh, really interesting in thinking about, um, about uncertainty, has been debates about how to ensure reliability, the uh, continuous supply of services from critical infrastructures. Now, by critical infrastructures, we mean electricity supply systems, water supply, but also infrastructures such as um, uh, safety within nuclear power stations, safety within air traffic control, and so on. And there's a huge set of people out there studying these systems for good reason, because when people in don't want the lights to go off, they want the water to flow out of the taps, they don't want to have their aeroplane crash, and they don't want the nuclear reactor to, to blow up. So the, uh, the sort of set of disciplines in public management and public administration and, 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 uh, and so on that have looked at critical infrastructures have uh, developed some ideas about how these operate. And I want to point to you to two books by um, Emery Rowe, um, and colleagues, uh, one co-written with uh, his colleague Schulman, which I think are really, really useful in thinking about uh, systems, reliability, and confronting uncertainty. Um, as mentioned in, in a previous talk, Emery Rowe is also engaged with debates about pastoralism. So, so long before us has developed this conversation between uh, different domains in interesting ways and his his paper on with others on high reliability pastoralism is a is a must read in this field I think but I think even pushing beyond what was written in that earlier paper we can start to think and learn from the research that him and his group have been doing in California on energy supply um, in interesting ways and they argue that reliability this continuous supply of valuable services, and one can think of electricity supply, but one could also think of the supply of services from a pastoral system, milk, meat, other products, is generated not just by coping, sort of managing things that come along, but by actual proactive intervention and innovation. And this, they argue, is undertaken by a category of professionals called reliability professionals, or MESS professionals, uh, Emery calls them, and they're skilled at dealing with complexity, messy situations, uncertainty. Their whole objective is to avoid getting into the domain of ignorance, but to try and learn bit by bit uh, what's happening and, and make sure the system is continuing to function. Failure in these systems is not acceptable uh, and potentially highly dangerous in the case of air traffic control and nuclear power, for example. Now, these professionals are not just working by themselves, they're working with others in networks. And in, in these cases, these are scientists and engineers and IT professionals and suppliers and regulators and others who all keep the systems running. So in a control room, um, it's these professionals who must assess the probabilities of likelihoods and outcomes. They must navigate uncertainty, ignorance, ambiguity, risk, and help na navigate their way towards, towards uh, safe supply. Now, in a number of Emery's books and papers, there's this diagram, which I won't go into the full details of, but it basically explains where reliability professionals sit in the system. They sit in between micro operations, the field, the, the uh, street level bureaucrats, the people who are at the micro level, and the macro design, the policy makers, the strategists, and so on. And it's in this zone between, uh, between those levels, if you like, of knowledge and, and focus that the reliability professionals are situated. And their job is to recognize patterns from spotting what's happening on the ground, from the micro operations, fluctuations in electricity supply and so on, but also develop scenarios about what might happen and respond to those. 
And uh, you know, to cut a very long story short, that's where what reliability professionals do. What's important is that many of the, these responses and these activities of the reliability professional are informal, based on so-called tacit knowledge, below the radar, often unnoticed, unrecognized, based on experience, based on little case studies that people apply, based on informal scenario analysis and, and pattern recognition. And they combine the skills of astute vigilance and accumulated experience, to quote, held in both individuals and connected networks. And that's how these systems are, are reliable. And these are very often unsung people. They don't have a job description, but they just do it. And if you're in there in a control room observing, and again, this is sort of eth the result of a more ethnographic type research, uh, they can be spotted. Now, rather as in the case of finance, in critical infrastructures, we see two, as it were, very different types of response to uncertainty. So the classic response is to reduce, following on from the last talk, uncertainty to risk. You develop a risk management approach, you, you do risk assessments, you have a control-based technocratic engineering response, and you, you do that within hierarchical management systems that mean different people have different, different roles. But we see again and again and again, when we have failures, um, this doesn't always work. Um, the other argument, which is coming out of this sort of reliability uh, approach, is to say that it actually a lot is happening in that middle zone of that diagram where these reliability um, professionals operate. Switching between micro and macro, tracking what's going on, much more informal. And that's what generates reliability. So quite different analysis, uh, sort of uh, diagnoses, both of the problem and of the solution. Again, differentiating between a control-orientated approach and a much more informal, uh, messy approach, but one, one that works. Now, for pastoralism, we might then ask, well, who are the reliability professionals in a pastoral system? Pastoral systems have to continue to supply good services and so on for sustaining people's livelihoods. But who are they? Who are these people? How do they connect together? What skills and aptitudes do people have? Are they the same as these, as these people in these control rooms? Can we learn from pastoralists uh, for control room operators and vice versa? What are the relationships that are developed? Institutional power relationships what knowledges and practices are required. And in new pastoral systems, for example, where there are absentee herd owners and only laborers running the system, does this relationship change? Do you have to develop new cultures and practices of reliability as pastoral systems uh, change? Many, many questions, but ones that I think the electricity systems of California and the pastoral systems of, of different parts of the world can speak to each other in interesting ways. Moving to the third area, um, disease outbreaks, early warning and preparedness. Now this is obviously a big area where uncertainty is central. There's a big debate in, in, uh, in disease management circles in the WHO and others at the moment of preparing for disease X. We don't know the disease. We don't even know when it's coming. Um, where is it coming? But actually, we, we know that some kind of recombination of genetic material in viruses and bacteria are going to result in what they're pleased to call the big one. Whether that's an influenza, whether that's a hemorrhagic fever, whether that's a, a, a bacterium linked to, you know, similar to cholera or whatever, we don't know. Ignorance dash uncertainty, dash ambiguity, absolutely central to thinking about disease. And the discourse of preparedness, getting ready for the event that we don't know exactly what it's going to be, is central to huge investments in global health. Um, there's a really nice book by a guy called Andrew Lakoff um, called Unprepared. Uh, global health 
in a time of emergency. And he traces in this book and a number of other papers the sort of history of preparedness thinking. And he makes the case that preparedness thinking as a way of responding to uncertainty um, and as an, as an alternative to state-based social protection and welfare or indeed insurance systems, but being prepared, having contingency plans and so on, is something that evolved in the, in the Cold War um, period where a whole series of civil contingency, defense responses developed in the West in particular and presumably in the Soviet Union as well as a response to a potential nuclear attack. And there was a sort of s s set of policy responses that evolved in that, uh, in that era. Crisis and emergency management committees, um, public information campaigns, the state as the protector of citizens against threat, which were highly organized, highly technocratic, often militarized and securitized, but also meant that the normal rules of democratic control were in the face of emergency, potential threat, were um, put aside. So, so this, these were undemocratic, technocratic, but in the name of protecting people or from a potential threat into the future. Now this sort of modality, I mean obviously in the, in the Cold War it had a particular form, has been translated into drought responses, into d disease responses and other emergency responses very much. As it were, the culture and what, he, what Lakoff and others and Collier and others would call the biopolitics, again referring back to notions of governmentality, uh, are very much part and parcel. So in the middle picture of the slide you see um, from, in this case, the International Migration Organization, the, the rapid assessment, prevention, detection, control sequence of activities, very much characteristic of what the World Health Organization and others do. Hard technocratic managerial intervention justified in the face of a crisis narrative or a sense of potential emergency. And we see this across the health sector, very much part and parcel of uh, how the system works. But in 2014-15, Ebola broke out in West Africa and the systems failed by and large. Um, the early warning didn't work, the response was poor, the coordination between um, agencies in, in, in the approach didn't work, there was a militarized response creating um, you know, emergency style uh, very much, very much in the mode of the crisis response, um, as it were, emerging out of that style developed in the, in the Cold War. But many people died and, and uh, as a consequence of failures in the system. So rather like the financial crash, there's been quite a lot of soul searching and reflection on what went wrong and why. And I think it's quite revealing. And there's a great book by Paul Richards um, on Ebola and response uh, that is reflects a wider literature on on the anthropology of Ebola and its response. And the big argument there is that the sort of biomedical and security responses fail if they if they fail to articulate with what people call cultural logics, prior experiences of the early earlier disease experiences, local livelihood contexts, practices of burial, practices of marketing, practices of migration. People have to continue to live even if a disease is spreading through their, their community. Um, and expecting everyone just to follow what the doctors say uh, is, is impossible. So it's, it's become well known now, of course, that you know, burial ceremonies in West Africa were a real important site of transmission and Ebola, unless you dealt with what was happening in the burial, at the burial sites, then the disease would continue to spread, equally transborder uh, marketing. What Paul says at the end of his book is that actually it was people's own knowledge and practice that shifted the patterns of the epidemic. Not as many people died as the models predicted, thank goodness. But uh, 
And this was because he observes, because of common sense, because of improvisation, distributed practical knowledge and collective action were invaluable elements in what he calls a people science of infectious, in, infection control. Now, notice the similarities with the debate about the, the finance and with the critical infrastructures. Collective uh, responses, practical knowledge, tacit knowledge, improvised uh, approaches, and uh, sort of what one might call practical common sense. So, the, in the debate about uh, disease control, again, um, I'm simplifying, of course, because there's, there's, there's uh, lots of grey areas in between. There are, in a way, again, two contrasting responses. One, uh, a response around preparedness and early warning, at source response, medicalized, securitized, often based on predictive uh, risk modeling, the conventional medical response, which in the case of Ebola uh, certainly didn't work. And another emerging debate that says it's about local practices, social relations, cultural log logic, community, collective responses that are really key. Not to forget the medicalized response. I mean, that th these aren't mutually exclusive. And that a more holistic so-called One Health approach uh, is necessary. So if we don't deal with the uncertainties at play and those social relations, then disease outbreaks can be worse and spread. Uh, is the bottom line argument and that more participatory uh, social cultural approaches are key. Now again I think this is is quite interesting when we're reflecting on pastoralism because here again um, there's a huge paraphernalia of early warning around drought and so on, a, a preparedness plans, contingency plans, social protection investments um, and so on humanitarian responses in, in pastoral areas, which perhaps could suffer to some extent from, as it were, the left-hand framing and could learn from the right-hand framing, to put it rather simply. Um, and again, a conversation about what does early warning mean, what does protection mean, what uh, forms of moral economy, if you like, can come into uh, a more sophisticated response to thinking about um, responding to emergencies or crises, which will inevitably come in uncertain complex systems, um, uh, can, we can learn again from these debates that's happening in, in health uh, and disease. So finally, um, of the four uh, domains that I've chosen, thinking, and this overlaps to some degree with the, the disease one that I've just discussed, uh, thinking about disasters and what one could call the political ecology of vulnerability. Now again, rather like um, around disease response, there's a whole set of fairly technical managerial responses um, to disasters um, that have evolved, uh, uh, encapsulated in the term disaster risk reduction, DRR approaches. The Sendai framework of 2015, as it were, is the UN's version of, uh, of that, the, the framework for disaster risk reduction, and frames most global and indeed national responses to, um, to this, which requires, again, the investment in technical systems, early warning, very like the disease approach, and as it were, what we might call facilitated coping. Um, a very apolitical, technical uh, response. But of course, disasters, as we all know, are uncertain, and of course, we all know, are deeply political. There's a very nice book on earthquakes that I came across, shows showing how actually you can't predict them, despite all the decades of work in geology and geosciences, that they're very unpredictable, and the mu much earthquake science, so-called, is incredibly problematic because it's premised on the uh, assumptions of the ability to predict uh, seismic events. 
Now, I was surprised by this because I thought at least, you know, in earth science, people knew what they were talking about and that there was a sort of predictive sense that this was all uh, nicely predictable and we'd know when an earthquake would come and so on and so forth. Well, this seems not to be the case either. Uncertainty, ignorance, all the things that we see in pastoral settings are just as, as, as relevant. And you could read that book and just translate earthquake to pastoral settings um, again and again. But the other point about disasters is not only are they unpredictable, uncertain in that deeper sense, um, surrounded by ignorance and, un and, and uncertainty around likelihoods and outcomes, they're very political. And the uh, Deepwater Horizon oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico is discussed by Michael Watts in a nice paper. And he argues in reflecting on this disaster, you can see a picture of the, uh, their attempts to put it out um, uh, in the middle there, um, that what happened within the company, Shell in this case, uh, was a pervasive commitment, or was it BP? I can't remember. Anyway, a big oil company. A uh, pervasive commitment to risk management, undermined, which undermined a culture of safety. And this was driven by this rush to get oil at the frontier. Um, a sort of a corporate strategy that meant that containing risk through technical means uh, was essential. But risks had to be taken because actually you, we, you had to get the last bit of oil out there to get your, your company profits. And this resulted in the culture within the company or that part of the company of secrecy, concealment, rule breaking, which was sanctioned well, to some extent uh, in daily practice and exposed the operation over time. To potential disaster. So again, it's the practices of people in the system. In, in, in Emery Rowe's terms, the, the, the uh, reliability professionals weren't there to offset the, the disaster. And, and Mike Watts's argument is that this was driven by a wider political context in the oil industry uh, in a period of neoliberalism. Uh, he quotes Foucault again, the motto of neoliberalism is live dangerously. Live dangerously where risk is something that is very much part and parcel of making profit. Capitalism uh, thrives off risk um, and competition uh, fuels that. So a combination, he argues, of aggressive corporate enclosure has been driven by financialized and technological approach to create a series of manufactured risks and accumulated insecurities. Um, all the direct result, uh, Mike argues, of the extension of neoliberal capitalism in new resource frontiers. So the point here is that risks are manufactured, they're, ma they're manufactured in a political context, um, these type of risks, um, and that uncertainties, ambiguities, forms of ignorance introduced uh, in the last talk are therefore social, economic and political processes together. They're not just natural hazards. These are unnatural hazards. They're political hazards. They're man manufactured hazards. Now, the natural world obviously is important. The relationship again between geology and oil and, and what explodes on a, on a gas platform has a, 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 a geological, ecological, technical dimension, of course, but it's these wider structural relations, cultures of safety that generate uncertainty, incertitudes and condition the response. Now, this is uh, essentially what one might call a broader political ecology, political economy perspective on uncertainty. Uh, that we're moving out of the sort of minutiae of the practices on the front line, but thinking about how risks and uncertainties are structured uh, politically. And Watts, uh, as well as many others, are very much you know, at the centre of, uh, of the literature on political ecology, so critical geography. Um, and here is their book, uh, Global Political Ecology, the successor to the very important earlier book, Liberation Ecologies, uh, that sort of set the field of political ecology uh, on its way. And their argument is, is essentially, as I've described, for the case of, of uh, 
of the um, of the oil disaster, but also to say that the risks and uncertainties are faced differentially by different groups of people. Who you are makes a big difference, and that is affected by race, by gender, by occupation, where you live. Vulnerabilities aren't natural, they're social. It's a kind of obvious point, but very often not taken as central to thinking about natural hazards as socio-political, nor thinking about how hazards are constructed in histories of capitalism. So again, simplifying, I know, but, but uh, we have, as it were, two uh, contrasting framings. One, seeing, as it were, the natural hazards framing, risk management, disaster risk re reduction, coping, adaptation, a very apolitical view. And a lot of the climate adaptation literature, as it were, sits in that mode. And then a more political econ economy and a political ecology approach, thinking about disasters in a different way. And I think, again, thinking about pastoralism, this could be incredibly important. Um, when we're thinking about risks, shocks faced by pastoralism, thinking about them not just as processes that people are coping with. There's a lot of literature in pastoral studies, if you like, about coping. And, and that would be a critique, I think, of um, the book that I edited, Living With, that sort of managing coping, uh, rather than more an active political engagement of, of both how um, how uh, uncertainties are created, manufactured politically, but also how they are affecting different people. So to conclude uh, the talk, um, si slightly stylistically, but I think still in relation to um, some real contrasts and differences, uh, drawing on Andy Sterling yet again um, and Step Centre work over many years, we see in a way two contrasting framings of how to think about risk versus uncertainty. This goes back to the last lecture, but I think it's reinforced again and again when we look at different domains. I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but you can get the, the, the contrast here. Um, which replicate those that we've discussed in each of the domains before. So linking these two talks on uncertainty, a risk and control uh, frame very much around um, sort of technocratic, expertise-led, um, hierarchical, organised, control-orientated approach can be very much contrasted with what uh, we've been calling a, a, a caring approach, uncertainty linking to care, a broader understanding of care and conviviality as introduced in the last talk, where we're thinking of, of, of multiple, um, multiple outcomes, a much more negotiated response, relying on more tacit experiential knowledge, social and cultural relations absolutely at the core, and a politics that requires us to uh, think about how to respond to uncertainty in new ways. And I think in different ways, each of these cases, these four cases, and as, as I said, you, we could have chosen a dozen others, uh, illustrate these, these contrasts. And I think for us in thinking forward about um, what does this mean in respect to pastoralism, these, I don't want to suggest that everything is co constructed in simple binaries and dichotomies, but thinking in these con contrasts, um, the, in thinking about how we can generate local uh, understandings of uncertainty, these uh, frames can be helpful. So rather than seeing pastoralism as something backward, unsophisticated, we can think of pastoralism rather more as a rather modern creative system, more similar to banking, to critical infrastructures, to uh, responding to diseases, um, and bring, it, bring pastoral studies, I think, by having a conversation across these domains, out of its slightly isolated set of debates as something sort of fascinating but slightly archaic, to say, yeah, pastoralism can, is more similar than we think to these other domains, but also we can learn 
from these other domains, but perhaps more significantly, we can learn from the margins, from pastoralism, uh, for these other settings in ways that perhaps we haven't done uh, as concretely as we might have done in the past.